So we look at Elijah, and uh, we can bring up the PowerPoint. We look at the Elijah who's uh, dealing with the kind of titled it Hope in a Cave of the Life of Elijah. Hope in a Cave, the Life of Elijah. Now, I'll just let you know right now, we're not going to get to the cave tonight. We're not going to get to the cave. We'll get to the cave next week. We got to set you up uh, just like uh, when uh, Brother uh, Darwin Robinson, uh, when he did his lesson and he talked about Jeremiah in the pit, you know, he said, you got you to gotta do some background work. You got to get some work to find out why he's in the pit and then talk about while he's there and then on the way out. So similar fashion, we've got to do some work to kind of let you know uh, how he gets into the cave, while he gets in the cave. So you need to know a little bit about uh, Elijah's story. But before we get to Elijah's story, uh, one of the, the, I guess if we look at the characters that are going to be involved, we're going to look at Elijah. We'll see the widow uh, of, Car of Zarephath. We'll see the widow. Uh, but we'll also uh, realize that Isaiah, that Elijah is prophesying in Israel. We have, we're during the time of the divided kingdom. And so Isaiah, uh, Elijah, excuse me, is prophesying in Israel while at the same time, there's a timeline of prophets and kings going on in Judah. But Isaiah, Elijah is over in Israel up in the Northern kingdoms prophesying uh, to those people there as well. And so uh, the, the person that, that he's going to be dealing with, the person that he'll go up against during his time, uh, Ahab, King Ahab and his wife Jezebel are two primary characters that we'll see in this story. So we've got Elijah, we have the widow who plays a major part in this story. Uh, then we see King Ahab and, King, and Queen Jezebel. Uh, and later on, we'll see Elisha uh, that comes into Elijah's story. But um, first part, you need to know and understand some of the drama that puts Ahab on the throne, which puts Ahab, because he's a major uh, part of this story. So we need to understand that. So for that, let's take a little walk backwards. Brother Bob, I don't, can't get the power. To, there we go. Okay, there we go. We got connected. All right, so now let us look at the history of leadership uh, of the people of Israel. So we'll go back to Exodus now. Before Exodus, before uh, Exodus, we have patriarchy. We have the patriarchal period where God spoke to the fathers, Adam being the first. And we see that line of, of him talking to the fathers, through Noah and through other prominent figures that are in the Bible story, all the way up to what we've been dealing with uh, you know, on Sunday morning, the life of, of Abraham, faith lessons from the life of Abraham. So we have Abraham, then we have his son Isaac, and then his two sons, Esau and Jacob, where predominantly we look at the life of Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. And then at the end of uh, Genesis, we find that Israel, uh, because of Joseph, is down in Egypt, where they will be for 400 years in captivity. But as we really understand God's story, God has them housed down there, protected in, uh, uh, down in, in Egypt from what's going on in Canaan. All right. So then we're introduced to Moses, a significant leader. We get into the mosaical period with the rise of Moses and Moses becomes a leader. Um, he, he grew up, was raised, uh, you know, even though all of these boys, Moses should have been, for all practical purposes, should have been dead. But for his mother and his father, uh, making a basket, hiding him, floating him down the Nile, his sister Miriam following behind, uh, Pharaoh's daughter plucks him up out of the water, just falls in love with this little baby, decides to raise him as her own son. Uh, Miriam's there. Hey, I'll go get a nursemaid, brings back his real mother. So his real mother was there, raised him. But uh, Moses grew up, was educated in e Egypt, with all the finest of Egypt, runs into some trouble as he's a man, uh, kills an Egyptian, and then later on flees, as Brother Maxwell dealt with in his lesson, and then flees. So we have 40 years of him in Egypt, 40 years out of the desert, and then God calls him and taps him to say, you've got to go back and deliver. It's time for my people uh, to come to the promised land, but really, when you think about it, it was time for them to come back home. Uh, the promised land had already been given to them. Abraham, and then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had already lived in Canaan. So now it's just time for you to go back home to the land of your father, of your forefathers, and, and uh, get back to that place that God had promised them. So Moses has tapped to do that. He goes in and hooks up with his brother Aaron and, to, and Aaron assists him in that leadership. And then of course out of uh, Aaron will become the 
a Levitical priesthood that'll be established. And then a young man who's a young man when, uh, when they're first leaving Egypt, Joshua will be a young minister to Moses and will minister with Moses, serve with Moses. Caleb also one of the, one of the two that went with, jo one of the ones that went with Joshua when they spied out the promised land as brother Mike Thorne talked about. So we have Joshua, Caleb, Joshua will become the leader after Moses passed on to take them into the promised land through the conquest of the promised land and get that established. Then we go after the death of Joshua, we go to a period of judges. And then as uh, Brother Bob talked about with the life of Samson, we have the judges that ruled and reign. And then after the period of the judges, then we get the prophet Eli who rules and reigns on the people. There's a problem with uh, Eli because Eli has some reckless sons who were doing all kind of iniquity amongst the people. Uh, Samuel is a young boy that's uh, brought in and serves and grows up in the house. But uh, Eli's sons were a terrible example and all the evil that they were doing in front of the people uh, was just really turning those people off, kind of turning them away from God. Really, they should have been following God, but they got turned off by uh, those two boys and what they did. And so the people cried out to Samuel uh, because they did not want to, uh, well, after the death of Eli and his two boys, his two boys are killed in battle and then Eli falls down and breaks his neck. And so they're, they're done. And so now the people are rejecting this leadership, the prophetical leadership of Samuel, a priest and, and prophet. And so they desire a king. The people want a king like the other nations. And so now Israel becomes a kingdom. Now we come to the times of the kings of Israel. And so then Saul uh, uh, becomes the first king of Israel, because, but Saul, the spirit leads him because of Saul's disobedience, Saul's uh, reluctance to follow God's commands. Uh, and so he runs into trouble with Samuel offering uh, sacrifices in the camp before they would go out to war. Samuel comes in, finds that Saul is, is taking on the role of the priest, offer sacrifice. And then uh, again, of course, with the Amalekites, then utterly destroy the Amalekites. And so, you know, three strikes, you're out. Saul, you're done. The Lord moves on and King David is then selected. And so then David becomes king. He's a king over Judah for a while because we have a rivalry still with Saul in the house of Saul. Even after Saul's death, Saul and Jonathan die, Ishbosheth will rise up and represent the house of Saul, still trying to keep this dynasty going. But eventually after he's gone, then the people come down uh, uh, to uh, Hebron where Judah, where David's at, and then promote him and make him king over all Israel. So David served as a king over Judah and over all of Israel. After the death of David, then we get Solomon, his son, will serve and reign as king. And so under David and Solomon, we see the height of Israel and their power, Israel as a nation. Under David, David makes him mighty because of his war, his conquering. Saul makes him great and rich because Saul was the wisest man. Saul amassed a lot of riches and his, his uh, fame goes out all over the world at that time uh, because of the, of the riches. And the king, queen of Sheba comes all the way up to see and witness the riches of King Solomon. So Israel is at its high point. Uh, with these two kings. Then, as always, the, the plot thickens, and then we go to the divided kingdom. The kingdom is divided after the death of Solomon. His son, Rehoboam, will become king of, of, uh, of uh, excuse me, Jeroboam. His son, Jeroboam, will become king, uh, and so the people come to him to find out how he's going to rule, how he's going to deal with them. Uh, he listens to older uh, men counsel to say, hey, go easy. You know, and the people will serve you, you know, be a servant to them. They will serve you. Listens to his friends, his compadres, his contemporaries. They say, no, nah, no, nah, don't do that. You make things harder. Your father was this hard. You're going to be, you know, several times harder than your father. So, and some explicit things that he, uh, that they tell him to say to the people. So he, he talks harshly with the people. And so then there's a rebellion and a revolt. And so uh, Jeroboam ends up being ruler over two tribes, over Judah. Uh, uh, Jeroboam and then Rehoboam, the first up in the north, and 11 tribes defect. And then under Rehoboam's leadership, uh, Rehoboam uh, becomes the king. So now we have the divided kingdom. Is that flip? Is that reverse? I'm sorry, I flipped it. So, uh, so Jeroboam is the king of Israel, and then, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, and uh, Rehoboam, uh, king of Judah. And so we have, uh, so now we have this divided. Uh, kingdom. And so now we're going to have two stories. We're going to have two different kingdoms going along. 
at the same time. We're going to have Judah down in the south and Israel up in the north. Okay, as we told you, uh, Elijah is going to minister to the, the Israelites in the north, the Israel side, the Israel side, and he's going to minister to them. So now we see the kings, we see the, a list of the kings uh, from uh, both sides. You see, uh, and so the first on, the, on your left, you'll see uh, the kings of, of Israel. On your right, you'll see the kings of Judah. And so we're going to look at it. So uh, in our story, we'll be looking at, we'll deal with this kind of a, a dynasty here. Uh, dealing with Na uh, Nadab, uh, Basha, Eli, Zimri, Omri, and then we get to Ahab. So this is how we get to Ahab. And so now let's tell you the story of how all this takes place. Now, for context, you can turn to 1 Kings chapter 16, 1 Kings chapter 16, and, uh, and then you can kind of follow along as I kind of uh, uh, get you through, kind of get you through this uh, lineage here so that we get down so that you understand how Ahab comes on the throne and why Ahab is the person that Ahab is. And so we've got to get you uh, there because he's going to be the protagonist in our story with Elijah. He's going to be the one that Elijah will confront and go against. And so there's a list of, of kings. We'll deal with those uh, first one, two, three, four, five, six from uh, uh, after Jeroboam. This wants to move. See if you can advance it for me, Bob. One. The next slide. Okay. There we go. All right. So now we get um, we look at a conclusion of a dynasty. A dynasty is a period where several kings, where the, uh, the rule passes from father to son or family members. So a dynasty is where one family continues on the throne. So David was a dynasty because David ruled, then his son ruled. Uh, Saul's family, Saul's house wanted a dynasty after Saul and Ishbosheth, and they wanted a dynasty, but it was not to be because the rule had already been passed over to David. So a dynasty is where you can keep a family period of time. It's kind of difficult to do. Uh, we talk about it today in our sports. We talk about dynasties when one team can win the championship for several years or for over a period of time can win several championships. We call them a dynasty. Well, these kings, so we have a dynasty with these kings. And so uh, we have Jeroboam the first because there was also Jeroboam the second who was the 14th king of Israel. So we have Jeroboam the first. He ruled over Israel for 22 years, and that's found in 1 Kings chapter 14 and 20. Uh, he became the prime example in scripture of an evil king, all right? So now, if you look in the dictionary, in the Bible dictionary, and you want the example of an evil king, of somebody who did evil, if you looked in the dictionary, there would be a picture of Jeroboam the first, because he is the example. And so several times in scriptures, in King, 1 Kings 15, 34, 1 Kings 16, 2, 1 Kings 16, 2, uh, 16, 2, verse 19, and also verse 26, we get this reference that they did evil like their father, Jeroboam. So that's, you got to be a pretty terrible guy, a pretty bad guy, when other people, when you get mentioned in history, that they say, hey, he did evil like this person, or he did evil like that person. So that's Jeroboam. So he's mentioned. Now, on the other side, we have the good example uh, on, on the Judah side, we have, if you did well, then they say, hey, you, they did. They followed an example of their father, David, their great-grandfather, David. Now, uh, over on that side, there is a dynasty. There is a lineage. But over this side, there's no dynasty. There's no straight line. And the rest, we'll see. So, but we see David. If they did like their father, David, then they would be they good. If they didn't do like their father, David, those kings in Judah says, and he did not do like their, his father David. He did not walk in the ways of his father David, and that lets you know it's evil. Over here in Israel, uh, pretty much all the examples are everybody's going to walk in the ways of Jeroboam, and Jeroboam is the example of the evil king, of, of all the evil that he did, and you can read that. So now, uh, after uh, Jeroboam the first, 
you have you have Nadab who inherited his father's throne as well as his father's evil way. He reigned only two years and was assassinated by uh, Basha, a man from Issachar. Now, uh, what's kind of left out is that Jeroboam had received some prophecy from the prophet Ahijah, Ahijah uh, and uh, he had been prophesied that his lineage, that his dynasty would be wiped out. All the members of his family would have been wiped out. So if now Jeroboam could have changed, we go back to Kings 14 and 15, he could have if he would have listened to the Lord, if Jeroboam would have listened to the Lord and ruled uh, as the Lord would have had him to rule, he could have survived, but he did not. He did evil. And so there already had been prophesied that Jeroboam's family would not survive. And so now we see that coming to effect as his son Nadab uh, uh, reigned for only two years, but he was assassinated by Basha, a man from Issachar. Okay, so Basha, Basha killed the king uh, and seized the throne, wiped out the king's family. So Basha killed Nadab the king, and then he seized the throne, put himself on the throne as a leader, and killed the king's family, wiped out everybody. So this fulfilled the prophecy of Ahijah that Jeroboam's family would be completely wiped out because of the sins that Jeroboam committed. And that the reference that is, is Kings 14, chapter first Kings 14, verses 10 through 16. So that fills that. And so that was the end of that dynasty of Jeroboam. Didn't last very long. It was Jeroboam the first, and then his son uh, Nadab, and then Basha came to the throne, wiped that family out, and then put himself on the throne. And so that ends that dynasty. Now we get, as we continue with this dynasty, we see Basha ruled for 24 years at Terzah. He copied the lifestyle of his predecessor. So that means he's going to do of, of his predecessor, uh, Nadab, who, of course, did like his father. So that means they were evil. So he's going to copy Nadab's example, who copied his father's example. The Lord sent prophet Jehu to tell the king that after his death, his family would be exterminated. His descendants would be slain and their corpses would be food for the dogs and the vultures. So now we have a second prophet of God comes up to a second king and tells him, your family's not going to last. Your family's not going to survive. All right. So Eli uh, is, a, uh, so, uh, Eli is assassinated. And so now after Basha uh, is assassinated, when we get Eli, uh, his father had a, a normal death. No, Basha, excuse me had a normal death, but his son, Eli is his son, uh, did not. They did not heed Solomon's words. And let's look at Ecclesiastes 10, 16 and 17. I thought this, uh, these words of, of in Ecclesiastes fit this particular situation. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. Ecclesiastes 10, 16 and 17 says, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Okay? Thy king is a child, meaning he's young, immature, and thy princes, it means the people that serve with him, eat in the morning. So now this, uh, understand this, eat in the morning is they're having feast in the morning. They're drunk in the morning. So if you eating in the morning and having a feast and getting drunk in the morning, when did that usually start? It started the night before, but they've continued it all the way up. And so they're eating and having a feast. And so, uh, so the, uh, the curse here from, uh, from Ecclesiastes from Solomon is woe to the land, woe to the land when thy king is a child and the princes, they eat in the morning. So they're eating and drinking, they're feasting in the morning means they started it last night and they've continued it. So woe. And then now uh, verse 17, blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. So you see the contrast, we see this, this, uh, this contrast on one hand, you know, when, you're, when your king is a child and his princes, they eat in the morning, they're eating, meaning they're eating and getting drunk in the morning, or on the other hand, blessed is the land when your king is the son of noble people. So that means that gives us an idea of character, of noble character, of how they're acting and carrying themselves. And their princes eat in due season. Mean they eat at the right time and they're eating for what? We eat food to get strong, to get strength, not to get drunk, all right? 
So now how this applies is because of, 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 of Eli. Eli and his princes, they, they were drunk, and so they were easy target to be assassinated. They, they, were, they were drunk, and so they assassinated, they were assassinated, and they did not heed the word of Solomon. Eli was a child, and his princes were eating in the morning, and so they were wiped out. Okay, so uh, there's another uh, person that's wiped out. This is Bosch's son. And so again, Jehu's uh, 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 words, prophetic words come to fulfillment as, as, a, as Eli, the son of Basha, is assassinated. The assassin was Zimri, who's captain of half of the charioteers of Israel. So there's, this is collusion at the highest. This is, this is the, a captain of the charioteers of half of the charioteers. He was captain. So Zimri came in and took out Eli, but he was an easy target because he was a child and he was drunk in the day. Him and his princes were drunk. So uh, they were easiest uh, targets to be assassinated, all right? So now Zimri did the same thing that, that, that Eli's father did, Basha, and he took the throne. Zimri seized the throne like Eli's father and then killed every member of Basha's family. Everyone of that family wiped them out, killed them. That's what you do with us. So you keep it in the dynasty because you don't want a son or somebody to escape and go into hiding and seclusion and then grow up and then come back one day because they got royal blood and say, hey, we rightfully uh, contest for the throne. No, so you end all of that, you just kill everybody. You kill, wipe out all that whole family. So there's no threat of anybody ever coming back and challenging you for the throne. So Zimri seized the throne like Eli's father, Basha did, killed every member of Basha's family. And so Basha fulfilled the prophecy of Abijah and Zimri fulfilled the prophecy of Jehu. So there's two prophets of God that were, God said, my word's not gonna come back to me void, and it did not. Uh, Basha, uh, uh, no, uh, excuse me, uh, Jeroboam was told that his family was going to be wiped out. Basha was told his family was going to be wiped out. And so that doesn't mean that the men that did these evil deeds were working for God. It's just that their evil fulfilled what God said was going to happen. So don't think that Zimri was that God, that they, that Zimri was an agent for the Lord. No, the Lord just revealed this was going to happen. And so these evil men just fulfilled the prophecy that, that God had told was going to happen. It goes on a little further. So now Zimri, who's been, who was the uh, captain of half of the charioteers, uh, he comes to the throne. He's going to only rule in Tezra for seven days. Doesn't last very long. So uh, evil begets evil. You get, you get someplace doing evil, evil's going to come back to you. Uh, we see it happen in this life. You get this person and the people that, that you got come back and their friends come and get you and then their friends come and get them and then it just keeps on spiraling out of control. So Zimri ruled for seven days in Tershra. The people that were encamped uh, against the uh, Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, it used to be a city of Israel and the territory of Dan, but now the Philistines have this city of Gibbethon and so the people were camped out of Israel, were camped out uh, in Gibbethon against this city. And so now they heard this, that Zimri had conspired and killed the king. So the people didn't, it didn't sit too well that Zimri had conspired and killed their king. So they said, okay. So they made Omri, who was the captain of the host of a of, of, of military position. So they made him king over all of Israel. And then they decided to march up and besiege Tersra. So the people, Omri and the people left Gibbethon where they was encamped and they were gonna march up to Tersra where uh, Zimri lived and besiege the city. Zimri saw that the city was taken, that they had taken the city and he went into the palace of the king's house and he set it on fire on himself and died in the fire. So Zimri is gone. So Omri survived, but there's a split. Uh, half of the people decided to go with Omri. Half of the other people decided to go with another man. You'll read that in, uh, in King 16. And so half of the people went with another man. Half of the people went with Omri. But Omri was able to uh, outlast. And the other person died. And so Omri was outlast. And so he was made king over Israel. So now he comes through to the throne. And so uh, Omri uh, is going to reign for 12 years. And so Omri will purchase a hill and he will, and it will become Samaria. And so there the capital will then move to Samaria. So that's how we get the capital of Israel 
in Samaria because Omri is going to purchase the hill with uh, silver. And so then that city will become Samaria and he's going to move the headquarters there. And so then after Omri's death, then Ahab, his son, becomes king after his death. So now that's how you see this long, this winding of an assassinations and intrigue that gets Ahab to the throne. So it's important for you to know that how this person, how Ahab gets to the throne and all the evil that's kind of happened before him. So now as we look at Ahab and we know that Ahab was wicked and his wife Jezebel was probably more wickeder than her as she establishes the rule of Baal within Israel, the worship of the God of Baal within Israel. So now you can understand that. Did uh, Ahab and them have any good examples coming up? No, everybody in front of them were wicked and evil and and there's intrigue and there's murder and assassinations and plotting and taking over the throne. So there's no good examples on the Israel side, starting from Jeroboam uh, the first and then coming all the way through. So we see how this dynasty concludes and that gets us to our, uh, the major uh, protagonist in our story, King Ahab. Now let's talk about the person of the hour. Let's talk about the prophet Elijah. Elijah is an important figure in the New Testament. Uh, John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, as we find in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And some of the people thought that he was the promised Elijah, that he was going to be the prophet like Elijah. Uh, John uh, chapter 1, verses 21, Malachi 4, 5, and 6, and Matthew 17, 10 through 13. Elijah was with Moses and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. Elijah is not a, a, a polished preacher like Isaiah was, and Jer like Isaiah or Jeremiah, who were a little more polished in their preaching. But uh, Elijah is more of a reformer who challenged the people to abandon their idols and return to the Lord. Uh, as we'll see during this time, uh, Jezebel had instituted uh, the worship of Baal amongst the people of Israel. And so they challenged, so uh, Elijah is there to challenge them to leave idol worship, re re reject that, and return to the Lord. And that's why the prophets there prophesying to the people of Israel uh, to try to get the people to turn back and come to the Lord and worship the Lord. Uh, what happened early on, going back to Jeroboam's time period, uh, when Jeroboam and those 11 tribes separated, uh, Jeroboam was very skilled. Jeroboam had spent time in Egypt. And so one of the things that Jeroboam uh, learned in Egypt was how to manipulate people through religion. So one of the things that Jeroboam does to keep the heart of the people from returning to the Lord, uh, uh, if, they would, if they would continue in their worship, continue to go down to Jerusalem, Jeroboam knew that the heart of the people would eventually return to the Lord and they would want to do what's right. So in order to keep them from doing what's right, he had to establish two places of worship. He established Bethel, established Dan in the south, so those people could go and say, hey, here's the place you can worship, and establish people uh, who were not even uh, qualified to be priests to be priests. And so he kept the people going there instead of allowing them to go back down to Jerusalem. And so gradually he could shift the people's hearts away from the true and living God and shift them to idol worship and would keep himself in, the, in power and keep him on the throne. So uh, Rehoboam, uh, Jeroboam learned that he spent time down in Egypt, and so he learned how to manipulate people through religion. And so early on in, in the, the nation of Israel, in the Israel, the tribes of Israel, and, the, and Israel as a nation, we see that they had already turned away from God. And so God continues to send these prophets there to try to get God's people to try to get them to return and come back to the Lord. Now we know that as Brother Greg did a wonderful message, uh, it's going to be uh, a lesson in, in futility. It's going to be futile because eventually they will go into captivity under the Assyrians and they will be wiped out and dispersed and they will never return as a people. Where Judah eventually will go into captivity, but after 70 years, uh, a remnant will be able to return to the land. So Elijah, uh, not a, as polished as, as Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, but he's there to challenge the people to return uh, and abandon uh, their idols and return to the Lord. He confronted Ahab personally and rebuked his sin and challenged the priest of Baal uh, to a public contest. So that's one of the high points of Elijah's life. He's going to personally uh, attack and, and uh, uh, challenge him to a contest that we'll talk about in a minute. The state of affairs for the people of Israel. 
They were governed by kings for many years, and several of these kings had been evil. Well, they, they had all been exact. For several years, these kings were evil. God was troubled with what the people were experiencing, and he delivered his prophet Elijah to guide them out of corruption and suffering. Elijah appears, and then quickly as he appeared, and now we're down into chapter 17, uh, he appeared and then disappeared as quickly as he came. His name means the Lord Jehovah is my God. Elijah's name, the Lord Jehovah is my God. And so now as we look at chapter 17 of, of 1 Kings, uh, we'll see that uh, God sends a drought as he is displeased with the people. And so he sends a drought uh, and puts a drought over the land because there, we see there was two droughts. And so Elijah is responsible for the drought that stops the rain from, from flowing on the earth. And so without that, without the rain flowing, they couldn't plant their crops and that would lead to some, uh, and their rivers and streams would dry up. So it would lead to some devastating times. And because, and this drought of rain comes because of the drought of God's word. God's word is a drought of God's word. There's no God's word being proclaimed, no worship uh, of God. So because of that drought, God calls it the drought of the rain. Because God had told him time again, if you obey me and you honor me, I'll take care of the land. But if you dishonor me, then, the, then I can't bless the land. I can't bless the land with the rains. And so we, uh, one of the significant things about this uh, uh, area of the world is some, we call it the Mediterranean climate. It's a Mediterranean climate. You get no rain in the summer. It's flat. No rain in the summer. It's just hot and dry. But then you have the early rains which come from uh, October through November. And then you have the latter rains, which come in March through April. And so they depend on those early rains in October through November, sometimes a little in December, and those latter rains in, in uh, April, March through April for their crops. Now, God shut it up that the, they didn't get the early rains and they didn't get the latter rain. So that's devastating for their, for their, uh, their grape, for their wine, for their uh, olives for all their uh, crops and all their products. They couldn't have water to feed their animals. They couldn't grow wheat and they couldn't grow, grow the, the feed for their animals. Rivers and streams would dry up. And this is all because of God, due to God, uh, because he was displeased with the people because there was a drought of God's word. So God sent a drought to Elijah to prophesy about the drought that would take place on their land. And so as quickly as Elijah appears in chapter 17, he disappears. Because God tells Elijah, okay, go hide yourself. And so Elijah went and hid himself out in a desert region where there was a river with drinking water. And God sent ravens to bring him food. And after the river dries up, then he goes to Zarephath. All right? And so you see the map here. We see the brook Kittereth. And uh, see the city where Elijah was from. He was a Tishbite. Uh, you see Samaria. Uh, the body of water in the middle is... Uh, the Jordan River, you see the Galilee uh, up there at the top, or the Galilee uh, 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 the Sea of Galilee, or it's really a lake. And then you see that runs into the Jordan River, which runs all the way down. Um, and so on the other side, uh, Elijah was camped out into this desert region on the other side of the Jordan River. And so God sent ravens uh, to feed him here. Now that's significant. Now, what we know about ravens, not the Baltimore Ravens football team, but a raven as an animal, would a raven bring you some food? Ravens are like, they're, they're uh, scavengers, like vultures. Uh, they're birds, they, they, they're there when stuff dies and they're there to take stuff for themselves. So, but, so we look at God, God used a bird that normally, that wouldn't bring you food, but he would come take food from you ravens and, and vultures and those kind of birds, those big birds would take food from you. They're, they're always on the hunt looking for prey, looking for things that have died or that they can kill, and they'll take some food from you. But God uses a raven to bring some food to uh, Elijah and to feed him and to nourish him with a bird who is a scavenger. He uses that bird to feed and nourish uh, Elijah uh, out by the, the brook Kittery. But then eventually when that brook uh, runs dry because of the drought that's going to last three years, then Elijah is instructed to move and go to Zarephath. And so now we see the next major episode. And, uh, and so during Elijah's lifetime, Elijah would be a part of or experience seven miracles. There are going to be seven miracles that either that he's a part of, create a part that he has a part in, 
or that he himself experiences uh, in his lifetime. All right, so we get to the widow at Zarephath. The widow at Zarephath, God instructs Elijah to go to the home of the widow who will provide him with food. God is still taking, it, taking care of Elijah. He's kind of, uh, you know, kind of away. He, uh, he had to uh, make the proclamation to, to Ahab, and then he goes out by the brook. Then after that dries up, then he comes into town and comes into the, the uh, into Zarephath. He instructs uh, Elijah to go home, to go to the home of the widow who will provide him with food. When Elijah comes to the town, he asks the widow to get him some water uh, and some bread. And of course, we know the story. The widow says, look, I'm down to the last. I've got my last meal. I'm going to take the water. And I'm going to go in there and I'm going to break some bread for me and my son. And then we're going to die because this is it. We're, we're, we're at the end. This is, we got our last little portion. You know, there's no water. There's no, we haven't had no crops, you know. So this is it. We're going we're gonna to do that. Elijah assured the widow that God would not allow their food to diminish until the rain returned. The food lasted until the rain returned. So, of course, the widow, um, it was a test of faith for the widow to trust Elijah, to trust this stranger, and to do as he instructed. You know, instead of making the meal for her and her son and just die, she said, no, make the meal for me. Fix the meal for me. Feed me, and then God will make sure he takes care of you. And so, uh, as according to to, to Elijah, it did happen. She trusted him, fed Elijah, and Eli and, and then uh, we know that God made it to where their food did not run out uh, during that time. When the widow's son died, God heard Elijah's prayer and brought him back to life. Uh, you know, the, the widow was probably confused and probably had, had blamed Elijah for this whole thing happening to her son, but Elijah was able to bring her son back, return her son because of God heard his prayer. The widow thought Elijah was probably the cause of the tragedy, but recognized uh, after he after Elijah restored her son, realized that he was a man of God. So that's the next major episode in uh, Elijah's life. Baal versus the God of Elijah. One of the high points of Elijah's life. Elijah confronts the evil king Ahab as the cause of problems for the people of Israel. That's why God has, has brought this drought because there was a drought of God's word in Israel. Elijah challenges Ahab to a demonstration of his deity, Baal versus God on Mount Carmel. This challenge is to offer sacrifices to their respective deities and see which start the fire to prove their divinity. And let's go into, into Kings and read that again. Let's go into. All right. Kings uh, uh, 18, verse 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For, uh, for ye are many and call on the name of your God, but put, uh, but put uh, no fire under and they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is, either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is on a journey. Or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. So um, uh, Elijah is doing what we call today a little trash talking, you know, friendly trash talking. But he, he still kind of elicited exciting some reaction. And so he's calling on them as noon. Elijah mocked them and he said, hey, cry louder. Maybe your God can't hear. You know, what's wrong? Your, your God can't hear. Maybe you need to cry a little louder to your God uh, for he is a God. Either is he talking, or maybe your God is having a conversation, he's talking. Or a prayer adventure is, maybe he's away, he's on a journey. A prayer adventure, he's asleep, and he must be awakened. So now, if you look at what Elijah said now about the true and living guy, is the true and living guy ever on a journey? Is he ever talking where he can't hear us? Is he ever sleeping? Is he ever, is any of those things that Elijah, uh, uh, you know, cried out and mocked them, is our God ever doing any of those things that he can't hear us or respond to us? The answer is no. Verse 28, and they cried aloud. 
right? So it's going to get them excited out. It's going to get the, those prophets excited. They cried aloud, and they cut themselves after, the, after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. So now, oh, they're really going into full tilt mode. They're crying louder and cutting themselves and doing all these different things, trying to elicit and trying to wake up their God. <clears throat> and um, imagine Elijah's there just watching the show. <laughs> imagine Elijah, just if you was Elijah, you're just watching the show. <laughs> you're just sitting there laughing. You're shaking your head. You're like, hey, come on, pour it on. Hey, yeah, do some more. Yeah, cry louder. Come on. Yeah, because Elijah is like, you know, being someplace that you already know the answer. Elijah already knows the answer that God is God. He already knows that their gods are false. So he's just egging them on, urging them on. All right, go on, keep on. And it came to pass when midday was past. So now they've been going from morning till noon. And when it came, when the midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. So they had gone all day, probably wore themselves out, exhausted their voice, and still there was no response. There was no voice. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. So this really, Elijah is putting this show on for the people. He wants the people, he's putting this contest on, not to just to embarrass the Ahab or embarrass these priests. The show is for the people. Elijah is is fighting for the hearts of the people. And he's putting on this public contest so that they can see who God really is. And so this is for the, this is for the benefit of the people. So Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar because all the crying and all the different things they do, they were jumping up on the altar, probably broke it down. So Elijah repairs the altar, puts things back together of the Lord that was broken down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be my name. So uh, they, so look at the symbolism, the 12 tribes, Israel, Israel will be my name. You're disrespecting my name, worshiping these false gods, the name of, you know, you're, you're the, the people of Israel, people of God. Uh, but but uh, Elijah's making a point here. So he takes the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. So now uh, Elijah is going to trench around the altar, repair the altar, then he put the stones, he's going to trench around it, dig a trench around it. And then he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice. So now He's going to drench the sacrifice, drench it, just soak it, four barrels, drench the sacrifice with water and, and on the wood. So uh, how many of us have tried to light some firewood that was soaking wet? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen to get some, some wood that's young and some kindling that's just wet and, and it's just moist. You have a hard time. You know, you need some dry wood. And he said, do it a second time. So not only going to do it, but four barrels of water, do it again. That, it, he's making a point. Do it again. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it again. A third time. And they did it a third time. Three times he's dumped all this water. Do it again. Wet it. Yeah, I want to make sure. I'm, he's stacking the odds. I'm going to keep stacking the odds of human impossibility. This is impossible. This is human impossible. I'm going to keep doing it. And the water ran about the altar and filled the pit. So he did this three times, four barrels of water, three times. He had dug this trench because now you've got a little pool of water that's totally circling of the altar. The altar's in the middle. He's got a trench around it. They doused the sacrifice four times, and all this water is running around in this trench. All right. And it came to pass at that time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, 
and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. Uh, the, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And he took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and he slew them. All right. So we see this fantastic scene here uh, of Elijah. Uh, not only this challenge, uh, the first part of the challenge, they have gone all day. The prophets, you know, cutting themselves. He's egging them on, do it more. And then finally, after they've gone all day and exhausted and haven't heard anything, then Elijah's like, okay, it's my turn. It's my turn. It's my turn. Okay. Get the, let's go get this. Cuts the animal in half, puts the stones around it. All right, four barrels of water. One time, four barrels of water. Two times, four barrels of water. Three times. Then he offers this prayer. And then the fire rains down, consumes everything, and licks up the water. And a fantastic sight. And so then the people say, uh, there is the, the Lord is the God. The Lord is the God. And then Elijah gets those prophets of Baal, those false prophets. Don't let any of them escape. Took them down and then slew them under. So a pretty fantastic scene uh, as, uh, from Elijah uh, to, uh, to take those prophets and to take care of those false prophets in such a way. So now we see this. We see Elijah at a very high point. Uh, in his life, he's uh, prophesied to uh, Ahab about the rain, and then he's disappeared. He's uh, been fed and nurtured uh, by the raven, bringing him uh, food, and, and he's by the brook. Then he goes to, to uh, Zarephath, and then the widow uh, takes care of him and feeds him and, and nurtures him during that time period uh, at Zarephath. He heals the widow's son, and then we have this fantastic sacrifice. So just the incline of Elijah going up, up, up. But after this point, and, and what we notice in the Bible, that after you come to a mountaintop, what's the only other place you can go? Down in the valley. When you hit the summit, when you get to the summit, you get to the mountaintop, get ready because the next thing coming is the valley. And so we see Elijah, this great man of God, is on a mountaintop. You would think he's on a high. You would think he's invincible. You think that he could just do anything, but next week we're going to find him down in the valley and we're going to find, we're going to meet Elijah the caveman. Next week, Elijah the caveman. So this is part one. Just get you the history, get you set so you can understand how uh, the, the main protagonist in the story, Ahab, becomes king. A lot of murder, a lot of intrigue, a lot of evil working. So yeah, you kind of understand um, how uh, this uh, evil man comes to the throne. And then uh, we see the fantastic works that, that he did with the widow. And then also uh, uh, with this, this uh, contest between the, the king himself and uh, the priest of Baal as he represents the almighty God and then triumphs. But then after that, we're going to see him sink down to some pretty low depths of uh, what we call today uh, some, some depression. Some depression. He's going to be depressed. He's going to be despondent. And so we'll notice those things. And then that's when we'll really get into seeing that hope, that hope that he has to have. What's that hope in that cave? What's that hope that gets him? Uh, and uh, as you see on that map, uh, from where uh, me and Brother Brant was talking about, it, from where he was up at Mount Carmel to where he ends up is a long distance. Uh, Elijah traveled a long distance. He tried to get just as far away from that as possible, but we'll talk about that next week, and that's where we'll pick up the story of Elijah in that cave and how God nurtures him and how God deals with him and then coming out of that cave, how he's renewed. And so uh, from Elijah, we can learn a lot about Elijah. We don't talk about mental health in the Bible. We don't, you know, cause it's just not, we don't see it as mental health, but we've got to see that Elijah, Elijah went through some burnout. He went through some burnout. He went through some depression there. And so we're going to see how did God uh, build Elijah back up. How did he come out of that? And we know the man that Elijah was after he came out of that cave. But we're going to get Elijah in the cave next week. We're going to deal with those issues as Elijah gets out of that cave. And we'll see hope in the cave on next week.